Today, we're gonna to take you on a journey through the narrow cobbled streets of Florence, the same streets where Michelangelo, Machiavelli, Leonardo, and the well-known members of the Medici family walked in the late 1400s, a time known as the Renaissance. We are, we are also going to explore how a German monk challenged the most powerful authority in all of Europe and changed the course of history through a time known as the Age of Reformation. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Lancy. I teach at Coral Gables Senior High School, which is in Miami, Florida. Hi everybody, my name is Todd Beach. I teach at Eastview High School in Apple Valley, Minnesota, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. And welcome to AP Live Review. All right, so as we get started today, we're gonna kind of talk you through what we're gonna plan to teach you and what our schedule is gonna be. Our purpose in these reviews are really to supplement the learning that you have done this year in your AP European history course. Uh, we are going to explore essential content in each lesson. We're gonna give you assignments to practice for the upcoming AP exam. We're also going to hope that you will engage in the homework. Um, the practice that we're providing is to help you be more successful on the exam. And in each succeeding session, we're going to, under, we're going to help you unpack the answers that you've given and we're gonna help you understand what you're learning and help you prepare for the AP test. And finally, we also want these review sessions to help you feel a sense of community. Um, there's students all across the country and from international schools around the world who are all getting ready for this exam that's right around the corner. So let you remember that you're not alone and everybody's practicing and, and hopefully our answers and our, our content pieces will help you as we go through these next sessions. During uh, this first learning week, sessions one, two, three, and four. So this is session number one. And our content review is gonna take you through the very first period, that's 1450 to 1648. And today we're gonna to talk about Renaissance and Reformations. Those will be our two content pieces. The skill development we're gonna to unpack today is how to respond to the short answer question, also known as the SAQ. And then for homework, we will give you an, a choice of SAQ, short answer questions to write. You can see what we have upcoming for session two and session three and session four on the screen. And the, you can see also that the daily, these AP review uh, videos kind of follow the same structure for us. You can see the skill development. So if you're wondering, when will I learn about LEQ or the DBQ? You can see that we have that coming up. We have how to make write your context in the thesis paragraph on, on deck for tomorrow. So we hope that you'll join us for each session and that it will help you prepare for your upcoming exam. Absolutely. It's also, we wanna remind you that we can't possibly cover everything that your teachers have already covered all year. So we're just trying to really focus on the essential content that you need in each of these units. And so you see this slide up here today about what our, our content pieces are gonna be. All right, so we're gonna start in unit one with the Italian Renaissance. And you can see up on the screen, a piece of our course and exam description. And the historical development that we're gonna talk about now is that Italian Renaissance humanists, including Petrarch, promoted a revival in classical literature and created new approaches to ancient texts some Renaissance humanists also furthered the values of secularism and individualism. And take a look real quick at that image you can see of the city of Florence and the Duomo and, and how important that, can, that building was. And I'm sure your teacher has talked about it or, or did talk about it at the beginning of the year. And so we're really focusing in right now on this amazing city of Florence where all of this knowledge and learning really starts to kind of emerge. Um, you can see on the image there, we have uh, Petrarch. He is our father of humanism. And so I wanted you to see, see his image. And so the Renaissance is really characterized by this deep interest in looking back at ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Um, they look at literature and philosophy, and there's new ideas about humans and human nature that are developed by looking back at the past and bringing that forward. And this really get, begins with Petrarch who you see there in the image on the right. And Petrarch believed that we were living in this glorious era where writers and artists would bring forward the glory of the classical past, looking back at ancient Greece and ancient Rome and bringing things forward into the present during the Renaissance. 
uh, he advocated strongly for a kind of classical scholarship, and that would become the intellectual centerpiece of the Renaissance, and it's called humanism. Uh, this was a program of study that emphasized the critical study of Greek and Latin literature, and it also valued the worthiness of human nature and human accomplishments. So along with this promoting of the revival in classical texts, there's also other ideologies that Renaissance humanists really valued, like secularism and individualism. And so these are very closely intertwined with humanism. Humanists focus, focus their attention on the present. And so the afterlife that had been so important in the Middle Ages kind of became less important. There's less of an emphasis on that. And individualism also becomes a prominent theme in Italy. Philosophers will write about the potential of man and they'll develop their own beliefs based on a, the kind of person an individual should aim or strive to be. And so this is all sort of the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. Um, as we move forward in the Renaissance, we also see this key concept that you see on the screen. And that is looking back at ancient Greek and ancient Rome brought this admiration for its political institutions. And it supported a revival of something called civic humanism. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and this civic humanist culture in the Italian city-states produced secular or non-religious models of for how individuals should behave and also for political behavior, how rulers should behave. And I'll give you a couple of examples of both of those. So you can see the image on your screen. That's a Castiglione painted by the famous, I do this in my class, Ninja Turtle, Raphael, the great uh, Renaissance artist, Raphael. And, and that's his portrait. And the very fact that Raphael painted his portrait really shows that he was important during this time. So we're looking at models of behavior that are secular. And so uh, when we're looking at the Renaissance in general, we see this idea of civic humanism really come to the forefront and be very important. And the Medici family, the very powerful banking family that ruled Florence from behind the scenes and, and out front as well, um, Lorenzo the Magnificent, the Lorenzo Medici, he was very well known for being an advocate of this idea called civic humanism. And this again gets pulled forward from ancient Greece uh, modeled on the ideas from there. It's the belief that it's really an intellectual's duty to be involved in politics and to help the community. Um, it was very strongly believed that someone had to be more than just passive in society, that they had to act and they had to take part. So when we're talking about individual behavior, our, our uh, Castiglione that you can see there on the screen wrote a very, very famous and well-known book called The Book of the Courtier. And this was really a training manual on how to be an ideal gentleman. It was a how-to book for somebody who wanted to kind of climb socially. And it described the broad academic uh, background that a gentleman should have, along with different traits like being really physically fit and skills in things like math and music and dance. So this was quite a bestseller. It was translated into many languages and it was widely read throughout Europe. So it was really very influential. And um, from the ideas of manuals for political behavior, I think it's really important to use as our illustrative example, Machiavelli's The Prince. So it's definitely the best example uh, that can be found during the Renaissance. In this book, Machiavelli uses classical and current examples to argue about the qualities that effective rulers need to have. And he did this because he personally lived through power struggles in Florence for over two decades. And I like to read this with my students. And we talk sometimes about the little fun quotes, like he believed that a ruler had to be both like a fox and like a lion, and that you know we need qualities of cunning and intelligence, but also qualities of strength and bravery and those kind of things. So obviously the prince is, is still a really important work in political science, it's endured today. And these come out of models for behavior during the Renaissance. So after the Renaissance in Italy, we start to see a movement into the North. And so the Northern Renaissance retains more of a religious focus, more, less secular than the Italian Renaissance, 
And that resulted in more human-centered naturalism that considered individuals and everyday life appropriate objects of artistic representation. So I, I think most of you from your classes are probably quite familiar with the, the artists of the Italian Renaissance, but art really changes some as it moves. And we, we're gonna do a little comparison between art in the Italian Renaissance and art during the Northern Renaissance. So if you're interested and you want more examples of specific works from the Renaissance, you can see on the screen that there's some AP Daily videos and AP Classroom that you can go watch. So you can look and see the specific works of art and they're in AP Daily 1.2 and AP Daily 1.3 in the second videos. So as we're looking at a comparison of Italian and Northern Renaissance art, in Italy, we really wanna talk about who's paying for the art. So in the Italian Renaissance, one of the biggest patrons of the art, of art was the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was uh, commissioning many, many important works. And I'm sure that your teachers showed you those at the beginning of your school year. Uh, you saw things like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and his David, and there's so many really incredible works of art that are paid for by the Catholic Church. Um, also, we have wealthy um, families that are going to patronize uh, the artists. We're going to see those Medici, fa Medici family that will purchase a lot of art and other wealthy uh, families as well. And in the Northern Renaissance, we see a shift and we see that we still need wealth to buy the art. So we see wealthy merchants that are going to be a part of that. And also monarchs are going to be the, the patrons of the arts. Um, we also see a bit of a difference sometimes in subjects that are depicted in the art. Because of that focus on ancient Greece and Rome during the Italian Renaissance, we see a lot of figures of mythology that are portrayed in those artworks. And we also see religious figures and scenes. So that's certainly a really big focus during the Italian Renaissance. And as we shift into the North, we start to see other things that are depicted in art. We see um, peasants that are in their everyday life doing their everyday things. And those are really deemed important where we don't really see that. In, in the Italian Renaissance. We see portraits and nature scenes, the interiors of people's homes, domestic interiors. And because of maybe the, the religious emphasis, we see fewer nudes in, in the North. And the actual materials that are used for art, they, that also shifts between the Italian and Northern Renaissance. So in the Italian Renaissance, we see a lot of frescoes, we see marble, being used as a medium for sculptures because Italy is so plentiful with it. And as we move into the North, that changes as well. We see a lot of oil paints, which is very um, important for the North, as well as wood being a medium that's going to be used. We get woodcuts out of, out of the Northern Renaissance. Um, there's a, a big focus in Italy on uh, scientific proportion, and we really shift that focus to sort of color and detail when we move North. Uh, both of these, uh, both of these art movements have things in common as well. Both of them do have religious subject matter. They're really important for both. We also see that they're both going to use the new um, in perspective that is that comes out of the Italian Renaissance that's going to be shared between them. And um, it's definitely if you're looking for more specific works of art, you can check out the AP Daily videos that are on the slide there. They um, both also use naturalism and uh, there are definitely some similarities. So this is also kind of the first time in our course that we've talked about the skill of, of uh, the historical reasoning process of comparison. So looking at a chart like that is a really good way to think about what your details might be and your evidence if you're comparing and contrasting two different things. And the last thing we wanna talk about as far as the Renaissance has to do with the idea of Christian humanism. And Christian humanism is embodied in the writings of many of these Christian humanists, but particularly Erasmus, who we'll talk about in a minute. And these are, um, these are thinkers that are really taking the ideas of the Renaissance and they're using this to um, reform religiously. And we're gonna see how this is gonna lead right into what Todd's gonna talk about in a moment. So we have these Northern Renaissance humanists, and let's take a look for a minute at the image that we have here, because one of them I'm gonna talk about, not right away, but we're gonna talk about um, Sir Thomas More. And he is an English humanist, and he writes a book, Utopia. And, and you can see here, this is sort of a, a map 
of what this island of utopia would look like that he's envisioning. And of course, that's become a word that's in our, excuse me, our vocabulary now. So when we're talking about Northern Renaissance humanists, uh, we, we want to start with Erasmus. Erasmus is our prince of humanists. He's definitely the most famous Northern humanist. He becomes a very famous reformer, and he wants to really find a way to bring the classical ideas like humanism and civic virtue and bring them together with Christian ideas from the Bible, things like love and piety. So he's not only looking back at classical sources the way that the Italian humanists were, he's looking at those along with original ancient Christian sources from church fathers. So he's trying to really marry these two things together. Erasmus also created a Greek version of the New Testament. And he's very famous for a work that's a satire called The Praise of Folly. And in the satire, uh, he's really criticizing both religious and political institutions. He believed that education was the key for reform. He created a Latin translation of the New Testament. And because of his criticism of the Catholic Church, he's accused of laying the egg that Martin Luther hatched. So his criticism of the Catholic Church, he's certainly not going to be alone in that. And there are going to be other reformers that are going to pick up on his initial ideas. And Todd's going to talk about those in just a minute. Um, and then back to the image that we started with, Thomas More is an English humanist, and he wrote Utopia in 1516. And here he describes his ideal place, right? And that's what that word has come to mean in our language, that he's talking about an island outside of Europe where all children receive an education in the classics, where there's no poverty or discord, and that the government has solved all the problems. There's religious toleration and there's no dissent or disagreement. And so, of course, that, that idea of his utopia has become a word that now we associate with, with our perfect idea of how things should be. All right, Todd. Okay, thanks, Katie. So we're going to move from Reform Renaissance into the age of Reformation. And Katie kind of led us right into that with talking about the humanists. So in the age of Reformation, we're going to see reformers such as Martin Luther and John Calvin pick up on the criticism of the Catholic Church. And what they're criticizing are, are things that, you know, the people have been talking about. But now we're going to we're going to bring kind of learned people to really talk about that and have that kind of discussion in a much more public way. Reformers Luther, Calvin, uh, and they're going to bring into these kind of new interpretations of Christian doctrine and practice. So we'll begin here. Here's just an image of Pope Julius II, and he's going to hold the office of Pope. One of the things you need to understand about this part of the course is the church is this major authority. They are um, not only religious authority, but they're kind of secular authority throughout much of Europe. They have kind of a real great political power uh, and, and that kind of pervasive av avenues all over people's lives. And, and, much, and much of it is in a very good way, but now we're gonna see how some of that is being criticized uh, by these new reformers. So we have Pope Julius II, born uh, this guy, <laughs> this, this Rovere, this would be Italian name, and he holds the office of Pope from 1503 until his death in 1513. And this is supposedly this image of him about 1510 in engraving. So the early 16th century, the Catholic Church is the center of life for all social classes, as I mentioned. Most people are very deeply pious. Katie kind of led us in, talked about this shift from Middle Ages into Renaissance. And so much of the thinking is this Middle Age type thinking where much of today is spent about thinking about our afterlife and how I prepare myself for the afterlife. There's a why people are also having a, a wide range of grievances with the church at this time. Educated lay people, such as the humanists that Katie talked about, urban residents, villagers, artisans, some church officials themselves look within the church and say, we need to make some things better. What are some of the signs of disorder that they're pointing to and abuse in the church? So one is clerical immorality. As you think about clerics and your local clerics in the community, you see them, people see them as kind of a model of behavior. These are the people we look up to, how we try to emulate ourselves. And if they're behaving immorally, then we start to question, you know, why, why do they get to behave that way? And then they tell us to behave a different way. 
the next time is next thing is going to be this, this idea of absenteeism and pluralism, as well as clerical ignorance. So there's a little cause effect here with number two, clerical ignorance, because we've just emerged. In fact, some of this is still going on as the Black Death and the plague from the late Middle Ages. And the people who would administer to the sick are clerics, priests, and nuns. And as the plague resides, we have fewer and fewer priests and nuns um, in, in these local parishes. And to kind of respond to that, the Catholic Church is kind of ushering through a very quick, if you will, tutorial about how to be a cleric. And, and because of that, they don't know Latin. And when they get up in front of the people and they try to speak the mass in Latin and they don't know it, it just doesn't land very well. And so there's that. There's also absenteeism and pluralism. Absenteeism is what that word is. We're not, they're not present. They don't show up. And then pluralism is that because there's this lack, um, because there are just not enough clerics, some are so it's supposed to be in charge of dioceses in different towns, and that doesn't sit well either. And then finally, there are privileges because as clerics, as part of the church, they, they don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to do a number of things that everyday people have to do. And so there's a little resentment that's built up around that as well. Okay, so we're going to shift really quick. That kind of gives you some, some, uh, some context about what's going on. And now we're going to talk about some of these main characters. And you're looking at this image. It's an illustration of the Dominican preacher, Johann Tetzel, selling indulgences. That's the thing inside a church. And so we have this really kind of nice image selling them. You see coins on the table there and a priest collecting them. And then it's kind of a piece of paper or a note. And then you see people lined up. They're all ready to go. And what the indulgence is, is it's a forgiveness of sins. And it, you can also get a forgiveness of your own sins, but you can get a forgiveness of sins for others in your family who may have already passed. And there's this idea that they may be stuck in purgatory and they may not be on their way up to heaven. And here's a way to spring them into, into heaven. And so it's a money-making machine, if you will. It's a branding. It's a way that the Catholic Church is raising revenue at a time when sometimes people don't really have the money to do this. So here we start with Martin Luther. He's an Augustinian monk, a German monk of the Augustinian order. And through his study in the New Testament, he comes to believe that salvation is obtained by faith alone. So this is a very different way of thinking than has been taught in the Catholic Church. And he kind of goes through a personal journey to get at this. He believed the scriptures revealed God to people, not the traditions and all the superstitions of the Catholic Church. And so he's going to break with some of the church teachings. And I just got done telling you that the church is this big authority. And so this is going to cause a rift and it's going to get noticed. During his time, Pope Leo X is authorizing a special indulgence, as we mentioned, to finance the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the world's largest Christian cathedral, the Basilica in Rome. And because of that, we it takes a lot of money. In the German states, then, these sales are run by Tetzel, who promised that the purchase of the indulgence will bring full forgiveness of one's sins or the sins of a loved one from purgatory. And he's even got a branding slogan, when the coin and coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And so it is like a 14, 15th century branding marketing thing that the church has going on. And German money, then, in this instance, is funneling out of Germany, going into Rome, and their resentment grows. <laughs> this image here of Luther <laughs> nailing the 95 Theses, it's kind of cartoonish, and I, I kind of chuckle a bit because you see, the, most often, uh, he, it's, it was just a kind of a place where people posted things on the church door, you know, bulletins, so people could read them. And here he is like, oh, I'm going to put this up here. And these people, onlookers are like, oh my gosh, he's really going to do it. I don't think it probably played out that way, but they're taking a little bit of uh, levity and making us laugh a little bit from this artwork. So we're here for the pro protesting this, this type of reform. So Luther is deeply troubled by the indulgences. And as he starts to think about it, he comes up with other grievances. And these are the 95 Theses. In response, he nails it to the church door in Wittenberg on October 31st, All Hallows' Eve. Because on All Hallows' Eve, the next day is Saint's Day. And he knows people will come to the church. They will see this. Um, and he, because of the printing press, he can now quickly print these things in Latin and in, the, and in German, and in vernacular. So they're widely disseminated and the ideas spread very quickly. Luther continues to write 
urging reform in the church. He wants things changed. His works are, are going to be condemned by Rome, and he is threatened with excommunication. This is a huge deal. To be excommunicated from the church is like to be pushed out of a community, to be shunned. And so in 1521, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time is Charles V, and he's going to call what is called a diet or a meeting, an assembly of notable nobility and clergy in the city of Worms in Germany. And he calls Luther to appear. Luther shows up. They, they say, did you write this? Did you do this? He says, yes, I did. They, they expect him to recant or to take back what he's written and what he said. And he refuses, even though he's threatened with excommunication. So this event is called the Diet of Worms. And it's this religious division in the German states. Charles V, who is a Habsburg, agrees later on to the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. That's a must-know date for you in history. You have to know, you have to have some of these anchor dates. When you know Peace of Augsburg, 1555, then you can think what happened before and what happened after. It's really, really important. What this does, though, is it stipulates that Protestantism to protest, this protesting form of religion, is now going to be allowed, and, and the German princes of the area can choose whether they will be Catholic lands or what is now being called Lutheran lands. So, and the people who live in those lands will also need to convert if uh, uh, to that land, to the, to the religion chosen by that particular prince. So what does that look like on a map? And I really wish I could just blow this up and make it bigger, but you can kind of see that this pinkish color, this orange is mostly Lutheran. So you see the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, you see Brandenburg, that's a part of Prussia. Um, and you can see how it's spreading, the Netherlands as well. And then it's kind of going down into lower Germany, parts of Austria. But you also see these pieces that are kind of yellowish are areas of wavering adherence. And that is that they're going to remain Catholic. Um, and so Austria, which is the seat of the Habsburg in Innsbruck, they're very Catholic and remain Catholic as well. And so you start to see this breaking up of what was once totally Catholic controlled. So the first area outside of Germany to officially accept the Reformation are the kingdoms of Denmark and Norway under King Christian III. It will be state-sponsored. It is Lutheranism. While that process of conversion went smoothly and quickly in Denmark, it happens more gradually in North Norway and over in Iceland due to resistance, but it does occur. In Sweden, Gustavus Vasa helped bring Protestantism to the region and then we start to see other reformers popping up. So proceeding from this idea of God's absolute sovereignty and God's omnipotence, John Calvin, who's Swiss, will conclude that human beings can do nothing to save themselves. Where Luther says, your salvation comes through faith alone, John Calvin says, actually, I don't think you can do anything. I think God has already predecided. God has determined at the beginning of time who will save and who will not be saved. And this idea is known as predestination. It's associated with John Calvin and what we call Calvinism. Calvin then is going to set up his own city government of in Geneva, Switzerland, and he's going to attempt in Geneva to regulate people's conduct in order to create a godly city on earth. So if it's not in the Bible, it cannot be done. God, uh, excuse me, card playing, dancing, other forms of recreational activity are banned in Calvin's Geneva. He, one of his students will be a man named John James Knox, a minister who studies in Geneva with Calvin. He's instrumental in getting the Scottish Parliament to set up a Calvinist church that is the official state church of Scotland, Presbyterianism. And so you see on the map this kind of purple color in Scotland, where but you see this Anglican color in England setting up other, other uh, detentions and wars and battles that will come later. Okay. All right. And I was really glad to hear you mention that idea of anchor dates. You know, I don't like AP Euro to be about students having to memorize a lot of dates, but I think it's really important that they do know some of these important dates and that they have a sense of chronology in the class. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because it's something that I'm always doing with my students. And especially as the exam is right around the corner, we want to make sure that you have some of these like sort of buzz dates that, that you know, and we want to make sure you have a sense of chronology of how things happen, because you're going to possibly have to show that on different parts of the exam. And the one that we're going to talk about today 
uh, we're going to talk about the SAQs or the short answer questions. So you're going to answer three questions. Uh, you have 40 minutes to answer those three questions, and it's 20% of the score. And we will, in a later session, go over more details about the format of the test. But, uh, but this is what you need to know. And as you are answering these questions, you're really analyzing historians' interpretations, you're looking at historical sources, and you're looking at propositions about history. So these are things that you need to do. You're gonna have questions that provide opportunities for you to demonstrate what you know best. And so I'm sure that many of you have practiced these in your own classes. Uh, the SAQs can include texts, they can include images, there can be a graph a, a, with statistics, there can be a map. Um, and then finally, you're gonna choose between two options for the final required SAQ. And that will focus on a different time period that you get to choose. So as we're looking at the SAQs generally, um, and Todd, if you'll move on, no, thank you. You're, we, there's three questions that you're gonna answer out of four. So SAQ one, is a required question. Every student taking the AP exam has to answer it. And that will include one or possibly two secondary source interpretations. Um, these are usually interpretations of a historian about an important historical event. And they focus on developments or processes between the year 1600 and 2001. So that's your time frame for SAQ1. Uh, SAQ2 is also required. Every student needs to write that answer, and that will be a primary source. Um, it will also be between 1600 and 2001. Um, it can very likely be an image, but it could also be a text. It could be a chart. It could be a map from the time period. So that'll be a primary source for SAQ2. And then for SAQ3, you get to choose between uh, two questions and you choose the one that you feel that you can do a better and stronger answer for. Um, the first one will be uh, covering the time period 1450 to 1648. And the second one will cut, or, or it could be, I'm sorry, 1648 to 1815. So anywhere in that first two time periods of AP Euro. And then uh, SAQ number four will cover the later part of the course. And it can be anywhere from 1815 pretty much through the, the present of the course. So there will not be a source for SAQ three or four, and um, we'll show you an example of those in a minute. They'll just be the tasks that you have to do, and there will be no stimulus attached to SAQ three or four, but you do get to choose the one that you like better. And Todd's gonna unpack the SAQ and talk a little bit more about format and, and skills. Okay, so when you get to the short answer question, the SAQ, there are these going to be these task words that we need to talk about. So straightforward task assessing content and skills. There are three parts for each SAQ, an A, B, and a C. Each part counts as one point. So one of the first things we need to do is understand what we're, what we're being asked and what is that task verb used for each part. So it could be to identify, and that means to indicate or provide information about a specific topic without elaboration or explanation. However, you do need to write in complete sentences. You should not bullet list in phrases. Um, that would not go over well. You need to have full sentences. Describe could be the task word. Provide just relevant characteristics of a specific topic. Just tell us what happened, okay? Or explain. Explain is a little higher bar, so you need to provide information about how or why a relationship process, pattern, position, situation, or outcome occurs using evidence and or reasoning. So in other words, tell us what happened and the how, why, or because of what happened. Okay. When you respond to the short answer question in the exam, you wanna label each response, your A, your B, and your C. So use the stem of the prompt to respond to the prompt. So when responding to explain prompts, be sure you include that how, why, or because. And just use that language. You've said something, you've said this has occurred, make sure you're adding on to it, this occurred because, or this is why this is happening at this time. So an example task that you might see, A is to explain how the historical situation in England led to political change in the 1500s. So again, the content is, oh my gosh, I have to know England 1500s 
to even have a, a broad idea of what kind of political change they're talking about, okay? Here's a sample response about just the stem of how you wanna respond. And this is, again, using the stem of the prompt to respond to the prompt, get yourself into that writing. The historical situation in England led to political change in the 1500s or because, because or due to, and then you're going to put in your, your, your response and your thinking and examples would be really helpful too. We also encourage you to use something we call a T structure. T being for topic sentence, E being for the evidence and example, and A for being analysis. So when you think about, I'm going to make a paragraph response, and it needs to have this kind of structure, topic, sentence, evidence, example. Some teachers may have taught you to use like CRE, which means claim, reasoning, example. And that's a great idea too. So whatever structure your teacher has taught you, please use that. This is the one that Katie and I use in our classes. And so that's why we're offering it here. So it's a best practice that'll work for both the short answer question and for your essay responses that we're gonna cover later in these reviews. And Katie's gonna start and walk you through, uh, I think it's a secondary source SAQ. Okay, so what you're seeing on the screen is like a short segment from a historian's uh, look at events of the French Revolution. Let's just read it together really quickly. It says, the revolutionary period of England may be said to have lasted near, nearly 50 years if we reckon from the beginning of the civil wars under Charles I, to the accession of William III in 1688. These, the efforts of these 50 years had no other real and permanent object than the establishment of the current constitution, which is the finest monument of justice and moral greatness existing in Europe. The same movement in the minds of men that brought about the revolution in England was the cause of that of France in 1789. Again, there's some other anchor dates just to point that out, right? Um, both belong to a new era in the progress of social order, the establishment of representative government, a point towards which humanity is directing itself. So as you're looking at understanding what the author is saying in this paragraph, the you would want to have a look at this paragraph, read through it, understand what the author's argument is, so that then you can look at the tasks that you need to answer that are related to this. So the first task is a describe, and it says describe one argument the author makes regarding the revolutions discussed in the passage. So you had to have the, um, the historical skill of interpretation, being able to read and understand the argument that the author is making. And then you move on to B, and B asks to identify one piece of evidence not found in the source that would support the author's claim regarding representative government. So you are looking at what do you know about the time period that could actually support what the author of the passage is saying. So what historical knowledge do you have, right? So you're gonna be trying to identify that historical knowledge. And then explain asks you to dig a little deeper and think about what historical knowledge can you explain that is a limitation of the author's view about the French Revolution. So what do you know about the, about the topic that you can dig into and explain, right? Not just identifying, but also really getting into a deeper uh, look at how or why that you know as a student that you've learned about the French Revolution that kind of undermines uh, the argument that the author is making. So these are, these are three pretty distinct tasks and you really wanna take a moment and read the passage and take a moment and really think about what that argument is and what you know about the time periods that the author is referring to. Hey, thanks, Katie. Yeah. SAQ2 is gonna be a, an, it's a primary source. And in this instance, they've given us an image. So when they give us an image, they're also gonna give you a source line. So I was telling my students, read the source line first, get yourself in that mindset. And so this is this French artist and has Colbert, presenting the members of the Royal Academy of Science to Louis XIV, 1667. So if you've done your reading, you know who Colbert is, you know who Louis XIV is. And if you're probably like my students, you're like, gosh, that was a while ago. That's part of the review. It's why you review. It's why you're watching our videos. Go back, make sure you're paying attention to who Colbert is and Louis XIV. And then we can take a look at the image. We see it's at, at Versailles. And then we start thinking, oh, this must be Louis, right? He's the king sitting down. He's holding this this kind of staff representing, uh, you know, that he's the one in charge. 
we have people presenting. Um, it's the Royal Academy of Science, so we see all these globes and maps and things being hung up here. So this gives us the image, and now we're going to look at our, our tasks. The A task is to describe one way in which the image depicts a significant feature of the scientific revolution. To respond to this question, then I have to know what was the scientific revolution about, what were the principal characteristics of the scientific revolution, and how can I connect them to what's going on in the image, okay? The B task, describe King Louis XIV's likely purpose in commissioning the painting. So um, the artist has been commissioned or paid by the main subject here, which is Louis, um, and why would Louis be doing something like that? That's what we're asking, describe why. And then our C task is explain. So you can see the describe, describe, and now we're working on explain. That means we have to do the how, why, or because. Explain one way in which development shown in the image changed or continued during the enlightenment. So we know scientific revolution leads to this in period of enlightenment. And now we have a question that's directly asking about change or continuity over that over of these developments over time. So really nice uh, put together SAQ there that is assessing a number of things that the students need to know. I really like that image. Um, so as I said before, those will be the first two SAQs that you have to do. And then we move on to SAQ three and four, which are just straightforward tasks, but they don't refer to either a historian's interpretation or to a primary source as SAQ2 is going to, going to refer to. And SAQ3 will just have these sort of straightforward tasks without a stimulus. So an example of one um, from the most recent AP exam is the one that you're seeing on the screen. And this is, they're asked to describe one specific example of a change in the role of religion in European daily life during the period 1450 to 1700. All right, so we're looking here at the reasoning process of change. Um, the B task kind of take, takes the other side of that and asks them to describe one specific example of continuity in the role of religion. So this is one of the reasoning processes I'm sure you've already practiced in class that things are changing, but some things also stay the same. So we've already talked uh, in our content piece about some pretty significant changes in religion but then what doesn't change about religion in the, in the B task. And then the C is that deeper explanation. And they'd like in a specific example, again, from 1450 to 1700, to explain how political authorities attempted to control religious beliefs or practice. So this is a, my students really liked uh, this SAQ. These are, it's very straightforward. It's really testing your knowledge and you have a, a moment to showcase what you know. But again, remember that C is talking about more than just sort of naming or identifying a political authority that is trying to control, but rather to explain how, how that political authority tried to control or even why, and going a little deeper, explanation requires more. So you will also, this is the one where you get choice. As Katie mentioned, there's no stimulus or source to look at. These are just straightforward questions, but you can choose, do I want these earlier questions or a set of later questions. So here are the later set in the A task describe one specific example of change in the role of the state in European daily life from the period 1900 to 1945. And so you see there's a lot of there's parallel between are we describing one specific example of change, describe one specific example of change, but we're change what is different in is the content and this is later content. So the B task then is going to be to describe one specific example of change in the role of the state in daily life in Western Europe in the period 1945 to 2000. Now, I would need you to notice they talked about Western Europe here. So you want to be make sure that you're looking at every word and making sure that you're answering the question. And then the C task is using a specific example from the period 1945 to 2000, explain how Eastern European states attempted to limit individual rights. So we have that explain task in the C task here, just as we do in the C prompt above. But now we've, we've focused the region on Eastern European states. So make sure you're paying attention to each little part of the question. But you have choice here. Do I want to do the early one or the late one? And then you sit and write your A, B, and C tasks. Absolutely. And Todd, if you don't mind, I also I, I want to emphasize something that I think is so important. And that is for 
and every question on the exam, students really taking a moment to make sure that they're doing a good job reading the question. I know that that exam is right around the corner and there's a lot of adrenaline you know, associated with that. And so there's sometimes this tendency to go really quickly. And if you do that and you miss important words like Western or Eastern, then you're gonna be providing evidence that doesn't actually qualify as evidence if it's not adhering to the, the actual question as it's asked. So it's really, really important on the AP exam that you read the prompts carefully and that you really think about what the prompts are asking because I know that there's this tendency to go fast. Okay. So uh, we want to give you practice. Uh, I know that, that we're, again, that exam is right around the corner. So if you're watching this on your computer or your laptop, you can grab your phone and scan the code or you're welcome to type out the um, tiny URL that you see on the screen because we have a Google Drive and that Google Drive has multiple pieces of practice in it. And today the practice is gonna be um, short answer questions for you to practice. And then on our uh, next session, what we're gonna do is really model the answers. And Todd, you're gonna go over kind of, again, the week and, and how, where we're going from here. Yep, so one more time there, you can pause the video obviously, but there you go for the QRL, the, the URL or the QR code. And then here's our learning for the, this first week of AP Live. And so today was session one, we did the content review of Renaissance Reformation. We're talking, broke down the SAQ today and your homework as Katie just pointed out is writing the SAQ. Tomorrow, um, or excuse me, the next session I should say, session two is about absolutism, constitutionalism. And then we'll look at some samples of the SAQ that was assigned as homework. So we'll look at, we'll unpack it, we'll tell you why it earned points or did not earn points. And then your skill development is we're gonna start looking at essay responses. We're gonna take it a piece at a time how do you construct contextualization and thesis for the LEQ and DBQ? And so the homework would be just writing context and thesis, those context thesis paragraph, how, what's a good strategy to get us into that? We're gonna be with you to do these, these eight sessions of review. We're gonna get you guys so ready, we're excited because um, we know that you're gonna just do a super job on all this. Absolutely. All right, Katie, thank you, do you so much. Oh. Yeah, thank you too. Hey, do you know what in yes. Italy they call a fake noodle? I don't know, Todd. What in Italy did it's they an call impasta, noodle? Katie? Impasta. Everyone knows this. Impasta. Should we warn everybody that they're in for eight sessions of really bad dad jokes? Should we? I don't who, know. Who's, who says they're bad? <laughs> who says they're bad? Take care. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.